Hello everyone, welcome to this lecture. So in this lecture we're going to talk about uh, deep learning and neural networks, in particular multilayer perceptron. So we're going to look at the history of where things all started, as well as like, you know, basic notion of neural networks. So if you look at the AI trends in 2020, so there are many applications that are actually have been popped up in the past year. And um, uh, the more focus was on the you know, virtual assistants where people uh, could actually use them in order to actually scheduling their task or like use them to uh, find the answers to the questions. An example of that is like a Cortana, the virtual system assistant by Microsoft or a Google Assistant. And these are actually were introduced uh, uh, by a deep learning backend where, uh, you know, they were, the solution provider were actually updating the backend so they can actually uh, generalize better and actually cover more uh, problems. Um, some of the other example, like your Socratic is also uh, which was acquired by Google, which was an AI uh, application, AI-based application that will helping students to actually find a solution or help find helps with their math problems. And, and these are on the category of like the assisting uh, systems or uh, where they providing assistance services. And on the on the other extreme, we have like the physician assistants, right, where you basically. Uh, providing some uh, diagnosis help or physician assistance in diagnosing like brain cancer or like the skin cancer and things alike. So what we're seeing, what we're seeing is that actually deep learning uh, has been widely used uh, in a variety of applications, especially in the um, assistance setting. And if we look at the general trend is actually uh, predicted that the, the revenue for AI-based applications, uh, for or AI-based systems, will be actually grown significantly until year 2025, and then that is estimated to be 40 billion dollars, which is a pretty big market. So now let's go uh, let's talk about uh, what the neural networks are, and then actually where things are started. So it all started by a paper that was introduced by McLaughlin and Pitts uh, in 1943 where they actually introduce what's called a neuron model, where they were inspired from uh, basically a biological neuron, and then they introduce a neuron model which could be used in order to solve some basic task like AND or, or, or NOT gates. Uh, and they provide the mathematical formulation, how can you, do, how can you basically do achieve that task. So here we have an example of the biological neuron where we have these dendrites. So you can think of these dendrites as inputs. So these are like, you know, it's called dendrites network. And then we have this axon which basically carries the impulse and fires if there is enough stimulation from the, you know, received from dendrites. So if the total stimulation is strong enough, it's like acting as an impulse, relaying that current in. And if it's not, if it's not stays, um, basically uh, silent and um, and then when, once it's uh, the stimulation is strong enough it fires or it actually spikes and actually pass the information through and then it goes back to what's called the recovery stage or uh, refactoring stage and then silence uh, for it goes to the silent mode for a while and then trying to process the new input as it comes and then these uh, axon terminals is also connected to other neurons, right? So they're not actually tightly connected for a long term. People were thinking whether these uh, the neurons are tightly connected, but it's actually is, uh, this is, these are connected to something called the synapses, where you basically the output goes into synapses and then the, the other neurons actually reads from that. So let's see how we could use this neuron model that uh, McLaughlin and Pitts introduced uh, to actually solve a problem, simple problem, like AND or OR and NOT gates. But before we're doing that, you may have this question of uh, how many actually neurons do we do we have in, in a, for for example, in a particular nervous nervous system of in a species, in particular animals. So uh, I got this from Wikipedia where you can see like, you know, we have this uh, species called bright at the top of this chart with like 200 neurons 
which is not quite a large number of neurons. And where when we find the human has like 86 billion neurons, so like this is an average neuron, uh, this is a number of neurons for, for an average adult. And we have African elephant for 257 billion neurons, which is a lot of neurons. So now let's go back to how can we basically use the Maclos and Pitts neuron model in order to actually um, represent or solve the problem for like some simple task like and or or gate or not gate. So you can see that the process starts as follows. So you have an input and then you do some computation on that input. Uh, once you basically compute that computation, you have a threshold function that actually decides what the output should be. In the case of a not function, so we have the input x and then we have a weight uh, w equal to minus 1 which is going to be multiplied by x and then what we do is that we have a threshold and then we compare, we compare the output of this computation with that threshold. So in case of 0, 0 times minus 1 gives you 0 and since the 0 is greater than minus 0 0.4 so the output would be 1 and if the output is less than minus 0 0.4 the output would be 0. In the case of 1 we get negative 1 which is less than this threshold that's why you get the the output of uh, 0. And if you wanted to basically uh, mo you know, model the AND uh, gate, so here's a truth table for AND gate, and then what we see here we have two input x1 and x2, and we perform a computation we have some weights so which we compute the, the, uh, the product, the sum of the product of input times weight so which gives us like a number and then we have a threshold where we actually anything above that threshold in this case will, will result to an output of 1 anything below this threshold will result to an output of 0 so in the case of if you have input 0 and 0 so the sum of the products of input times the weights would be 0 so 0 times 1 is 0 and plus 0 times 1 gives you 0 which is less than 1.2 that's why the output would be 0 in case of 1 and 1 so you get the the sum would be 2 because 1 times 1 plus 1 times 1 which is greater than this threshold then the output would be 2 so that's the neuron model simple model that actually will enable uh, us to actually solve this very simple problem and again if you wanted to look at this problem more closely you will see that actually this is a problem where you can basically you can basically use a linear uh, model to actually uh, uh, basically uh, separate the classes right so basically you can use a linearly separable uh, these are linearly separable right so a question as a quiz for you guys is to think about how can we basically use this neuron model the way that I define it here to actually solve an XOR problem. So and then right after that uh, Frank Rosenbalt in 1957 introduced what's called the perceptron and the idea is basically you have uh, you have like a bunch of inputs and then you have weights so similar to um, uh, the Mac and Pitt approach. So you basically perform some input function computation. So which basically in this case is a sum of the uh, product of the uh, weights times input, and and then and then once you have that sum, it goes to an activation function that actually determines what the output should be. So. Um, and then they call it this is a learning algorithm for the neuron model so and then once you have this then you, you'll use the output as the output of your uh, perceptron uh, in order to predict or, or, or classify uh, but uh, for a long time people were actually talking about how can we basically train this uh, perceptron uh, or multi-layer perceptron and then it was in 1960 where Withrow and Hoffs uh, produ uh, introduced a uh, line and then where basically they propose a differentiable neuron model where you're basically computing the, the error rate, I mean the error, and then you basically 
uh, use that error in order to modify the await. So if you are basically getting an output, uh, so um, the question is, right, so how far is the output for the known training example? So for the known training data point, so you know what is the actual value of the output, right? Whereas when you put those inputs into this model, into this uh, uh, perceptron, and then you get the output. If the output matches the actual output, then you're fine. If not, then you have to go back and then start updating this way. So that's why this, like the 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 process of how can we basically utilizing this error in order to modify this uh, these weights. And the weights, if you wanted to basically resonate, or if you recall, the biological neuron are actually representing how this how strong the signal is, right? So these are the strengths of the signals which will eventually cause this activation fire or axon to basically fire. And then, so a lot of people actually showed variety of formulation. How can we train these, uh, you know, perceptron or multilayer perceptron? And then it wasn't until like 1986 where Hinton and his colleague produced, uh, basically proposed a method, a, a specific uh, formulation of how to train, how to efficiently train uh, a multilayer perceptron. Because back then the, the approaches were not actually efficient and that's why people are actually not using these uh, due to like the, the complexity of the training process. So in that paper, which is uh, called Learning Representation by Backpropagation Errors, they uh, showed uh, within this specific, with a specific formulation, uh, and then a nice, well, with a specific setup, you were able to actually train these multilayer perceptron. And then that was a paper where they actually introduced backpropagation, which we're gonna talk about that. I mean, that was actually where things had started, and you know, right after that, there was a lot of other papers and essentially uh, this paper was a, kind of like a basis for a lot of deep learning research that we're doing that we're seeing today so now let's go back to talk about what actually neural neural net are doing so what what they're trying to do is basically trying to map input features uh, to to their output so they're trying to learn or find an approximation or a a function that can map the input to the output. So, uh, and then you may have this question, like why we are actually going after these complex, you know, uh, functions where, um, or why we need to basically make a complex uh, function or learn such a function where we have already learned in class or like a very simple model like linear regression or logistic regression where we can actually use them in order to achieve the same goal. But there are many cases where like the, uh, the training data or the data set that we're trying to build a model for, it's not like a linearly separable where we can easily use linear regression or things like that, right? So there are complex structure and there are oftentimes there are a lot of non-linearity that we need to capture and things like that which requires a method that will actually is flexible enough to to learn you know those complex structure and also capture nonlinearities. that's that's where actually these neural nets shine and come into place and if you look at the uh, the neural network so it's basically a network of neurons so like uh, you know biological neuron right so which we saw which are like actually connected together so we can actually form a network of neurons where we have input uh, layer in the neural network which actually representing the input features and then and then we'll have some hidden layer which report which performs some transformation or some you know provide some representation of the input and then and then we have the output layer which basically tells us what should be the output of this uh, network you know, for a given input. So, and, and the reason that's called the hidden layer, so and there are many reasons, but uh, you know, one of the reasons is that, so first of all, they're not part of the input and output. So, uh, they are, you know, if you have like a multi of these layers, you cannot just call them middle layer. So, so it was chosen hidden layer. And the other th thing is that you don't know in advance 
like what values this neuron will hold, right? So it's kind of like forget, hidden from you. So the only thing that you know is like this is an input and then what, what's the potential actual output? What should the output look like, right? So you don't know the value of these computational units. So that's why it's hidden uh, uh, from the user. So, and then uh, if you wanted to show how uh, these uh, operations are actually performed, so let's just go back and then review what we had in linear regression. So in linear regression, so we're actually having inputs and then a couple of like the you know, weights. So we're basically having like the product, sum of the product of the input times weight, right? So, and then in, in, in this case, we're adding this neuron or axon, you, if you will, to basically uh, react based on the strengths of the signal, the strengths of these weights. And then it, and then, and then output something, right? So where we have like, set of inputs, x1 uh, to xn, so these are the input features, a, a vector x, and then we have set of weights where we actually calculate the sum of uh, dot product, you know, product of the input times the, the weights. So that gives us that linear regression that we already saw. But like I said, so there are, these are really good where we have like the linear sampler uh, data, right? So whereas in, in many cases, like these examples that we have on the slide, so the data is not linearly separable, right? So, and there is like a very, uh, we need to actually have like some sort of a, you know, a mechanism that can allow us or help us to actually capture this nonlinearity, right? So or this complex structure, right? When these mapping, you know, this uh, structure is not linear, so then we're using the, uh, we are actually uh, using neural nets, which, which basically we're trying to find, uh, you know, activation function or a mechanism within those axons, right, so we saw in the biological neuron that will fire uh, best when, when it's actually given a data in that, in the structure that we currently have. So, um, and then once we chose the right activation function that can actually induce the nonlinearity that we want, then the question is that, okay, so how can we basically update the weights? How can we go back and then, because we don't know these weights or those, uh, this signal strengths in advance, right? So we have to uh, basically learn them. So uh, the question is how we do this. And then in terms of a classification problem, a binary classification, so we saw in class we were using logistic regression, right? So for linearly separable uh, data. And uh, so, um, but in this case, we're basically uh, using something similar. So in order to, in order to update uh, the weight, so if we have uh, data points like Xi, which is misclassified, and then and then and then we know the label we actually know the actual true label right so for this uh, for this particular data points uh, and then now we have the output of our neural network multilayer perceptron as yi so we can simply go and update the new weights by just adding something or subtracting something from the old weights right it's depending on uh, you know the, the the classification so so and then um, and then we have the parameter lambda, which is which gets the value between zero and one, and then we have this di, which is a desired label. So something that we wanted to have, something that we know from a training data set. So in terms of a, in case of a binary classification, we know the for example for the input x one, uh, we have a d one that needs to be zero, but uh, our network uh, produced a one, which shouldn't be that. So that was misclassification. Uh, misclassifying that data point, so we're actually plugging those numbers here and then compute the new weights. And then we basically uh, update all the weights uh, accordingly uh, until we get the desired classification as we want. Right. And then, uh, depending on the representation that you wanted to capture, and then we have the op output layer. So this structure will has been shown that actually will like like with this can capture a lot of more complex uh, functions 
like XOR or some of the functions that are like you know not uh, cannot be approximated by a linear function. So let's go through an example of how we calculate things. Right. So imagine that we have two samples, you know, sample records inside a training data set. So let's assume that like we have uh, student one and student two, and then these are like some attributes, some values for some features of these students. Uh, for which we wanted to predict something, whether they pass like data X or they fail the class. So uh, in a linear regression step, so basically uh, what you do, you can you can call this even pre-activation, you're basically computing the sum of uh, a product of the input times weight. And if you plug these numbers, you get this value over here. And then if you plug plug these numbers, uh, for the record two, you get this uh, uh, basically this value. But if you wanted to do like a, like a binary classification of whether they actually fail or not, so you basically pick a threshold function, right? So and that threshold function, depending on what the threshold is or what you know percentage of the students like you think uh, could pass potentially or not, depending on like for example. Uh, this uh, these attributes, then what will happen is that if the uh, that threshold function would actually output like the uh, what the desired output, like in this case the threshold function output uh, the whatever the input t is, as long as the t is less than three, and then if it's not, it actually outputs zero. So we see that for the first students, if we use this threshold function, we get the Output of 1.3 uh, uh, for this uh, for this network, and then uh, for the second one we get the output of zero. But uh, you know, if you wanted to do like a binary classification, right? So what we wanted to get a probability, or like basically, uh, like this previous example, we can get the different values depending on the threshold function. Or if you wanted to basically squash everything between zero and one, or treat that output as a probability, and then pick a threshold to to basically uh, identify whether the student pass or fail the class, then we basically use like a sig uh, activation function, in this case sigmoid, right? So which uh, which we already saw the definition of this uh, sigmoid in class, and then the only thing that we need to do, we basically apply sigmoid on the output of this sum or a pre-activation function right so which we already calculated and then we get this two values right so and then once we have once we have these two values then we can set a threshold and say hey if and then we can pick a threshold function that help us to assign label zero or one to these two uh, students right so whether pass or fail so if the threshold, uh, if the the output is uh, greater than uh, 0.6, then the output would be one, and if the less than that is zero, and then by the way you can actually pick the threshold that suits your need, uh, your uh, that's a hyperparameter that you need to tune, and and then for these two examples, so we get both one, right? Meaning that these two students, you know, in that part of hypothetical example, will pass the course. And then if you get the b below uh, 0.6, then the output would be zero. So hopefully I give you an example of, like at least a, a basic example of how things work. And then uh, what I wanted to show you is also uh, a, a cool tool that was developed by people at TensorFlow called Playground TensorFlow, where you basically can um, find uh, can can basically uh, find a tool or a visualization that helps you see uh, how these neural networks are, are trained, how a multi-layer perceptron with the different inputs are trained. .org, so you end up with this. So there are a bunch of inputs, so you pick your desired input. And then there are a bunch of parameters that you need to uh, set. So for now, we just need to worry about like this ratio, the test train and test split, so 50% or 80 to 20%, whatever you wanted to set this. So you set that, and we don't want to add noise, so, and then, uh, and then you pick your activation function, in this case, sigmoid. 
and then we don't want it to do regularization at this point. So regularization, as we saw in class earlier, so it's a way for basically making sure that this is not overfitting. So we'll talk about that in a second. And then this is a classification problem. So we have two classes, orange and blue. And then you can basically uh, create different inputs or even add different uh, hidden layers uh, or even move, uh, remove layers or add neurons to each hidden layer or remove from that. And then you have the output layer. And then once you um, basically set up the structure that you want and you hit play, and it actually shows you uh, the process, the function that's going to be learned by this neural net. So initially, uh, it's not able to basically separate these two classes, but eventually, after like many many epochs, where you know epoch is actually going through the training data set once. That's one epoch, and if you're going through trainings many many times, and then and then you learn how to update those weights based on the misclassification that you're doing. You see that it, it actually it's able to pretty well, you know, find these uh, decision boundaries, right, and then separate these two classes pretty well, right. Uh, and then you see this is a loss, and this is a training loss on the test. Uh, tell you, see, it gives you also the test loss and training loss, which is quite low, right. And then as you you know go through many many epoch, you see that there's not a lot of you know. Uh, decrease in a test loss and it's actually stop somewhere. Okay, so that was just an example, a cool tool that I wanted to the slide. So uh, there are many activation functions. So we have that uh, product of the input times weights and then we had that threshold function that you choose based on your need and but there are many uh, uh, activation functions that you can pick from. For like sigma we saw it's used for a binary classification or if you have like if you wanted to create an output and then use it as a probability uh, uh, then you can use sigmoid or you know probability of the, the of, you know being classified as zero or one uh, given a, a specific input so we have hyperbolic 10 or 10h so you can use that one or we'll see relu and then or softmax you can use that for multi-class a classification problem, right? So where you have more than like one class, and two classes, right? So a question you might have also, right? The how like the neural nets are trained, right? So uh, let's just go through an example of uh, how things we saw that how one uh, uh, multi-layer, uh, how a neural network with one hidden layer is actually uh, trained. So, um, um, and then, and then we will see how the process is actually uh, is done. I mean, the training process. So there's there's two steps. So one is a forward uh, process, and there's a backward process. In the forward process, so it's like uh, the example that we saw where you actually where we assume that the neural network has already been trained, right? So, but now we're trying to look at is how actually we're training this neural network, right? So in order to make a prediction, we actually go through the forward pass. So you basically, we have an input, assuming that this is trained. So we have input, and then so we have, uh, you know, corresponding weights for this given neuron, right? So there's this weight and also this weight. And then what we do, we basically multiply, compute that sum, right? So multiply inputs, but the corresponding weights associated with the neuron in the hidden layer. And then you, we sum them as we saw before, and then we get this one, and then in this example, particular example, uh, we chose sigmoid, uh, where we basically uh, apply that sigmoid on the sum, and then uh, we get this output, right? So the process is uh, repeated for all the neurons within the, within the hidden, hidden layer, and then so once we have these numbers, so basically you, you, uh, then we move forward. You can think of these neurons as like a simple computational unit where they actually uh, perform a computation and then they hold the number, right? So this is the value of the neuron after we perform the computation that we just saw, meaning that like, you know, computing those, the sum of the product of the input times, uh, previous, uh, you know, the, the weights, and then, and then run it through the activation function. And then we do the same, right? So if you have many, many uh, hidden layer here, so you do the same. 
until like the last hidden layer where you actually need to connect this to the output for which you also have weights and then you do the same right so you multiply the neuron uh, value times weight and then you get the uh, and then you compute the sum and then you pass it through the activation function that you have and then you get an output so that's the output or the prediction of the model and then you know, then you can think of it if you wanted to do like a, a binary classification you can pick a threshold and then based on that based on that threshold you react where this this particular input should be classified as zero or one so if you wanted to look at the mathematical representation so we have this input x uh, vector x and then we have this vector w that that's going to be learned so these are the axon weights or the strengths of the signals that we saw before and then so in this in the forward propagation so what we do we compute the dot product of the vector x on w and they get that gives us that sum that we're looking for which we actually pass this vector through that activation function whatever that we we saw the sigma function and then we get the the output so that would be the forward pass right so this is assuming that the neural network is trained but the question is uh, how can we learn these weights so it's not a so it's not known in advance so so or how can we basically find those weights or in other words the the strengths of those connections or the signals that we're talking about so the neural network is actually learning them right so you, what you do you initialize all those weights with some random weights and then you pick a re all a record from your training data set right and then you calculate the output like here right so imagine that we initialize these random numbers and then we pick an input and then we compute the output so that's a forward pass and then uh, we pick a loss function so either a cross entropy loss or whatever loss that you wanted to pick and then we calculate that loss with respect to the actual output value in the data so we have a training record with the actual output and then and then we have the output of our neural network based on those random weights and then that gives us, you know, and then we use our loss function to calculate that loss. So, and then in order to calculate that loss, so typically, depend, you know, uh, based on, you know, what we do, we basically find the gradients of that uh, cost function that we have, right? So the gradients tells us which direction we should go in order to, for example, you know, each direction we go uh, to increase the loss. So that's the that's the direction that the gradients once we have the gradients it tells us if we go into the direction of the gradients it actually will increasing the loss but our uh, problem is that we don't want it to increase the loss we want it to decrease the loss that's why we learn uh, we basically convert that learning algorithm to the optimization problem right so where we basically wanted to minimize the loss uh, in this case we go into the direction uh, opposite direction of the gradients right so if you think of this like this like surface where we, you started somewhere on the peak of this hill or like somewhere around here in the hill so then you compute the gradients but you don't go in the direction the gradients tells you you are basically going uh, basically uh, to the direction of the negative of the uh, gradient so that's that's called uh, the gradient descent meaning that you're actually trying to minimize that cost function your loss function right your loss so if you're minimizing that cost meaning that you're minimizing your loss then the difference between the output of your uh, neural networks and the actual output would be close to zero or very little right so that's why you see or you're following this path downhill in order to find the bottom where you have the minimum uh, error or minimum loss so and this is typically uh, done through that back propagation where we start uh, um, similar to the uh, forward path so we start instead of starting from the input now we're starting from the output so we calculate the loss and then modify these weights which actually reflects here and then we actually propagate that back all the way to the input and then we do this recursively uh, many many time until we reach some like the acceptable performance that we're, we're actually looking at so we already 
I already show you a few activation function, but recall that the sigwinked function uh, is one of the popular activation functions that people were using in order to basically, especially for the binary classification, where you um, it has nice properties. Uh, it's positive. It has an upper bound and lower bound between zero and one. A lot of you know um, you know large negative values or large positive values will end up you know close to zero or one, right? So these properties actually made it a uh, uh, good option for people uh, utilizing it. And in terms of like, uh, we're not covering in this class, but when you're actually computing the gradients at some point, if you, know, if you look at the mathematical formulation, it also involves the derivative of the uh, loss and uh, derivative of activation function. And during that back proc, when you compute the gradient of the activation function, you may end up seeing that at some point, right, it actually would be close to one or zero, right? So very close to zero or one, meaning that like the gradients will be basically um, when the function is when the function is basically very close to zero or one, right? So then the gradients would be uh, very very close to zero, meaning that you are not updating the weights or you are not changing, um, you know. Uh, you know a lot right so you know the gradients become a little bit like not not saying meaningful or not actually useful enough right so that's the problem what's called the vanishing gradient so the gradients actually vanishes meaning that you're actually getting a number very very close to zero when you're actually calculating the gradients of uh, sigmoid and then you know the learning is actually lows right so you're not actually learning uh, as quickly as you are used to. So in order to basically address this problem, so you know one of the solution was a ReLU or rectify linear unit activation function, which also has like nice properties. It's, it has a lower bound. So and this is simply for any values less than zero, the output is zero and for anything greater than zero is identity. It's basically the input. So um, and, and as you can see here, that in the, for this, for ReLU, for all the values greater than zero, so the derivative is constant, so like the, the sigmoid activation, right? So which, which you can utilize in order to add this, that, that the vanishing problem, vanishing gradient problems. Another thing that is also important to know is, uh, you know, we sign class that like a regularization is important in order to make sure that uh, we're not overfitting, right? So the neural nets, are notorious in learning or memorizing the training data set, right? So memorizing, uh, meaning that like, you know, they they are they capture pretty well, they, they can represent or learn whatever is inside the training data set, but when it comes to a new input, or when you want to generalize, they're not performing well, right? So the neural network are, like I said, notorious on actually memorizing that. So that's why we need to also regularize them. So one of the common approaches is dropouts. And, in order to regularize neural networks. And the way it works is that like during the, the training process, so what we're doing, you we basically randomly, uh, basically uh, removing some of these neurons from the hidden layers, right? So what happens is, so when you remove a neuron uh, from hidden layer, so what happens, all the connection associated with that neuron is actually also removed. And then you end up with a simpler architecture rather than a complex architecture that you had initially, and then, and then, and then in the next round you actually, uh, next iteration you basically randomly turn off some of the other neurons, and this way you basically um, trying to uh, avoid uh, any like you know uh, intradependent learning that could happen across these neurons inside. Uh, the hidden layers, right? So every time that you go through this process, so you randomly, you know, you, know, you, you flip a coin, and then you know, with some probability, you turn off the, some of these neurons, and then you don't know in advance what, what they are, uh, so that like you know, uh, it decreases the chance of neural to memorizing all that, or your training data set, and it's, it's been shown that it's generalized pretty well. It works. So, so to, just to recap. Uh, if you wanted to find a function or with a, that actually could capture a complex structure or, uh, uh, or nonlinearity, 
So neural nets are a good uh, potential candidate for that that will help us to actually map input features to the output. Uh, uh, and then there would be some weights associated to those inputs you know, in the multi layer perceptron and we need to learn those. And uh, you know we have you know the function that we're going to learn is actually trying to uh, utilize the inputs and all, all those weights in order to transforming uh, the representation to the output. So I have an example, uh, a simple quiz for you. So uh, I want you to uh, draw a, a multi-layer perceptron with this particular structure that we have here. So uh, we have like a hidden layer, the first hidden layer with three nodes, and then we have the second hidden layer with four. What we're trying to ask you is to basically draw that structure, right? Uh, g g having in mind that like we, you have two inputs and uh, two hidden layers with three nodes and four nodes and the output is only one single number so how many ways do you need right and then once you have that and then given like these weights right the value for the weights are uh you know these numbers and then if you give a uh, input of three and two which are those two inputs and then given this weight metric so what would be the output assuming that the activation function is as a sigmoid so you can pause here and then start uh, working on this and then come back again once you have the solution okay so if you have already done it so here are the answers so you can just check your answer against this uh, solution uh, to see whether you got it right or not so in summary, so we're using, like I said, neural net for basically learning that function approximation uh, from a given set of inputs. So uh, we're basically trying to learn that approximation. Uh, and then um, this, is, this is often referred to as a representational learning. So it means that you don't have to, like you start handcrafting features and then, you know, uh, trying to you know do a lot of feature engineering or feature summarization so uh, in terms of like the image classifications or uh, natural language processing those representation or uh, representational learning uh, will, will help a lot so you don't have to spend a ton of time actually doing that uh, that, that featureization uh, but uh, they are also very good in, uh, in capturing low dose nonlinearities or complex structure uh, where we cannot actually uh, efficiently model with like uh, much simpler structure or simpler model like linear regression so uh, so they're actually useful in that sense as well so on the other hand so there are some like drawbacks you need a lot of data so there are like lots of parameters that you need to learn you know basically learn or uh, tune so a lot you know you know, if you go, if you look at like a, some of the uh, best known image classification uh, task or your know, natural language processing task, so and then you look at some of the state of the art uh, uh, neural nets or models that were trained by uh, big giants, so there are like billions of millions of parameters or billions of weights in those uh, neural networks or deep neural nets that they built. Uh, for a specific tasks so that's a lot of you know uh, computational power is needed also in order to basically train those so other than that so that's good go to solution for the things that we just discussed okay so hopefully uh, you find this useful and uh, thanks for listening